a nuclear reactor operates at low radiation levels. Contrary to what people are incited to believe, nuclear power is currently the safest platform for large-scale electric power production. It is many times safer than coal-powered plants that have an enormous impact in the form of respiratory diseases. In comparison, well-designed nuclear plants cause zero inherent pollution. There are presently 500 nuclear reactors operating in the world. A few accidents has caused some deaths and some damage, but those have all been relatively minor in comparison with the health damage caused by coal-fired power plants. A nuclear reactor of the type shown here typically contains 100 tons of uranium. In all the nuclear accidents combined, probably only a fraction of a single ton was released, while 5,000 tons of uranium has been spread across the world with the use of depleted uranium weapons, and in a form that becomes inhaled by people. The masters of empire are presently mobilizing public perception into an anti-nuclear frenzy with a goal to shut down all nuclear power plants in the world while the stockpile of uranium weapons is being quietly enlarged. This adds up to a suicidal track on two fronts simultaneously. Nuclear power plants utilize the isotope U-235 of uranium that emits atomic neutrons. Naturally uranium contains 0.72% of U-235. This natural concentration as it is is sufficient to operate a nuclear power reactor, such as the Canadian-designed heavy water reactor shown here. By the burn-up in the reactor of the U-235, the U-235 concentration becomes reduced. With this the reactive efficiency becomes reduced also. The uranium fuel is typically burned down to 0.4% in a heavy water reactor, after that it becomes depleted waste, or is enriched again. Weapons-grade depleted uranium typically has its U-235 drawn down to 0.2%, about half the concentration that a nuclear power reactor can operate on efficiently. While the weapons-grade DU concentration is too low to power a nuclear reactor, it still emits the same powerful neutron radiation, only less in quantity. This radiation is, and remains, as damaging to the human biology as alpha radiation, when it is brought into close contact with it, a neutron is typically slowed down in the human body, just as it is in a nuclear reactor, until it becomes absorbed by another atom. In this process it ionizes the surrounding tissue, stripping electrons away from them. When the neutron is finally absorbed it decays into a proton and emits beta and gamma radiation, which in close approximation, where the effective energy is high, is highly damaging to cells. In fact, neutron radiation damage is so extensive that a form of cancer treatment has been developed that uses shaped neutron radiation focused from several directions onto the cancer cells to kill the wildly replicating cells that had their DNA previously damaged. That neutron radiation kills is also evident by the development of the neutron bomb, a kind of atom bomb that kills only people and leaves the cities and infrastructures intact. The depleted uranium that is vaporized with weapons, though being depleted to some extent remains a powerful neutron emitter. No natural process exists that places a powerful alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron emitter right inside the human body. Only the atom bomb and the depleted uranium weapons do this, and they do this effectively with worldwide distribution, considering the enormous amount of radioactive material that has been vaporized, and the vastly greater amount that is presently prepared to be vaporized with a possible 100-fold increase, consider the following. To judge the damage that is being done. The first atomic bomb contained 64 kilograms of uranium, of which less than a kilogram underwent nuclear fission, and of this mass only 0.6 gram was transformed into energy. The radiation effect of the 64 kilograms of uranium exploding caused 200,000 deaths in the aftermath, or three times as many as the direct casualties. Compare the 64 kilograms with the 5 million kilograms of uranium that were vaporized in the Afghan and Iraqi wars and you can get an idea of the extent of the human damage that was caused. The DU wars have thus put well over 78,000 times the Hiroshima amount of radioactive pollution into the air, most of it so finely pulverized that it became a part of the air, affecting birds, insects, 
animals, and humans alike. When CNN reported a six-fold increase in lung cancer in the USA three years later, the consequences were slowly coming home. It may well be that the decimation of the honeybees throughout the northern hemisphere may be caused by the massive radioactive pollution of the world with the weapons of war. It is hard to imagine what the potential 100-fold increase will cause, according to what appears to be known about the existing DU weapon stockpiles. That the uranium damage is not imagined is evident by Kuwait's reaction to the fire of an army base where a small number of depleted uranium munitions had burned. The long-term effects were such that after 17 years the Kuwait government requested to the U.S. to scrape up the sands from the base and around it and take it home. This wouldn't have happened if the DU pollution was harmless, as it is officially being said in an effort to keep the war engines going. But this obviously isn't the case, the repatriation of the pollution really happened. In April 2008, the newly built container ship BBC Alabama, a charter vessel, was en route from Kuwait to the U.S. carrying 6,700 tons of Kuwait sand that had become contaminated with depleted uranium munitions when Doha Army Base in Kuwait caught fire 17 years earlier in the 1991 Gulf War. Neither government will discuss just how much the repatriation of the pollution has cost. 160 containers filled with sand were loaded onto rail cars and shipped to an Idaho-based waste disposal site owned by a company called American Ecology. According to the Pentagon's annual base structure report, which itemizes its foreign and domestic military real estate, the Department of Defense operated at the time more than 800 bases around the world, 5,311, if one counts the ones in American territories, and on the U.S. mainland, and probably well over 6,000, if one counts the small ones, like Doha and Kuwait, that for some reason didn't make the list. Similarly omitted were all U.S. bases in Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, Kyrgyzstan, Qatar, and Uzbekistan. The point is that uranium weapons pollution retains its deadly effect so that after 17 years of obvious political pressure and unknown number of lives destroyed or disabled as a consequence of the lingering pollution, the pollution was finally taken back home, with Kuwait probably footing the bill to get it done and the pollution was likely of a lesser type than that which gets vaporized into the air by impact effects that create far higher temperatures than a mere fire. The impact fire of a uranium anti tank shell is so intense that in one case, when children were playing near a targeted tank, they had their clothes and skin burned off instantly. The victims inside the tanks were summarily nicknamed crispy critters. That's the dimension of the modern war and of the now massively stockpiled uranium bombs and munitions, when the uranium radioactive agent is dispersed with the wind, the entire geometry of warfare begins to change. With the dawn of the DU wars, it is no longer necessary to physically attack a targeted nation. It is sufficient to carry out the bombing nearby. With Iran being centrally located on the Eurasian continent, it becomes a convenient dumping ground for the real intended targets of empire, its historic targets, Russia, India, and China. The global jet streams typically flow in their direction from Iran. Also, once such a war gets going, it is hard to stop. Russia will find it nearly impossible to defend itself against such a war when its territory is not directly attacked, likewise China and India. As if it was in response to such a possibility, China has recently deployed a fleet of small mobile ICBMs, the DF-31 system, that can pepper the U.S. west coast with nuclear blasts, that would produce enough fallout to disable the rest of the USA, which would then stop the attack. If the attack happens, and won't be stopped, then we should look for a different planet to live on, as the Earth would then become largely uninhabitable. The resulting highly unpredictable consequences that this type of warfare and the response to it would bring would then also likely develop against the background of a global energy crisis. As the result of it being attacked Iran would likely shut down a large chunk of the world's oil supply that flows through the Strait of Hormuz that Iran would be well able to block. Of course, the resulting chaos would be one of the desired outcomes that the masters of empire require the war for in the first place. Will there be war? Israel will answer this question.
senior U.S. military and intelligence sources have warned in early June 2011 that U.S. military forces have been conducting big contingency planning drills for a U.S. intervention in the wake of an Israeli strike on targets in Iran. The sources estimate that the target date for such a joint Israel-U.S. attack on Iran could be as early as July of this year. Others suggest that the attack may not begin until after the retirement of U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and U.S. Admiral Mullen at the end of September, who have both been powerful factors in holding back such attacks so far. The root of the danger is that both the U.S. and Israeli governments are committed to follow the dictates of empire no matter the cost. With the masters of empire now facing an existential crisis on a scale that has never been seen before, a gigantic war may well be on the horizon unless many patriotic elements in both countries will care enough to assure that the potential tragedy does not happen. When the giant war begins, North Korea will likely be added to the target list for the more direct targeting of China. It has been reported in 2005 that 2.7 million do bombs and munitions have been pre-positioned in South Korea, according to a U.S. document dated August 2003 that became available through the Freedom of Information Act. A stockpile of such a size has been estimated to contain over 60 million kilograms of uranium, or 12 times the amount used during the Iraq and Afghanistan invasions, combined. Since the prepositioned stockpile would likely have been increased, and also considering that Iran is a much larger target, we may expect a 50-fold increase in the radioactive dew pollution of the world over and above what we have seen so far, which already had immense global consequences. What we have seen so far is unimaginably horrid. In the war zones, birth defects have increased 20-fold, cancers 50-fold, with horrors too horrible to tell or to present visually. The worldwide effect is equally tragic as the radioactive uranium dust is transported by the jet streams around the world. The destructive particles become inhaled worldwide. Nobody knows how many are inhaled every day, nor can anyone predict what their effect in individual cases may be. Once inside the body, the particles have the potential to wreck DNA that is so fragile that minuscule disturbances of only 6 to 10 electron volts are sufficient to break the DNA links. In comparison the alpha particles packs an energy of 4.2 million electron volts. But not only DNA is affected by these nucleonic cannons that have become lodged in the most intimate places in the human body. The human biology is a structure of extremely complex molecules that become massively destroyed by the nucleonic bullets. Over 90 different disease symptoms have been linked to this unpredictable cause. Over 500,000 American Gulf War veterans have become physically disabled in numerous ways, summarized as the Gulf War Syndrome, which may have been largely caused by ingested or inhaled radiation. On the worldwide scene, Diabetes, which has been identified as one of the marker diseases, has increased from 30 million cases for diabetes to, to 230 million cases since the dew bombing began in Yugoslavia and in the first Iraq war. The biggest increase in diabetes occurred in India, which is located downwind from both the Iraq and Afghanistan theaters of war. But even the far-off USA was caught up in the disabling maelstrom. CNN reported on March 8 in 2006 that a six-fold increase in lung cancer has occurred inside the USA. This has enormous consequences. While no empiric proof will ever be possible to link these increases with the due wars, the timing suggests that such a link is highly likely. Other evidence supports this suggestion, 